James here, putting on my Besker Steel suit to give you my spoiler-filled thoughts on the first episode of The Mandalorian, which debuted just last night on Disney+. Plus. So overall, the show's fantastic and makes the cost of Disney Plus absolutely worth it just by itself. It looks and sounds like a big-budget Star Wars production, but the framework of the universe that Star Wars inhabits is perfect for an action, a live-action series, and it gives us more time to explore the characters, the story, and also the universe, and most importantly, the lore, which is absolutely going to be huge to the series if this first episode is any indication. I'm really surprised it's taken this long to get a live-action Star Wars series, but The Mandalorian was worth the wait, because the show already has me hooked with an incredible cliffhanger that I don't think anybody saw coming. So from here on out, we're getting into the spoilers of the episode, so if you haven't watched it, i do so and come back watch this video later, or don't do either of those things. I don't control you. You can do what you want. So, on to the episode. We start right off on this icy, frozen planet, and just from the beginning, the show looks great. It's a very high budget. The sound is great. It looks and sounds and feels like Star Wars, and that's the highest uh, praise you can give the show right off the bat. So Pedro uh, Pascal's Mandalorian gives this icy performance, very befitting of the planet he's on. He smashes some dudes together before taking his very amiable mark. So Pedro Pascal plays the Mandalorian. He's a bounty hunter. And the show is set five years after the fall of the Empire in Return of the Jedi. So Pascal's armor looks great, and it's very lived in. There's these cuts and these scars. And then we're immediately told it's Beskar Steel, which explains how he can take so many laser blasts and still walk away. Um, it also becomes very important later on in this episode, and we'll get to that. So even though the Mandalorian barely speaks in these opening scenes, Pascal gives a multi-layered performance, but in the beginning we really see how confident and capable he is. And he also seems to be very no-frills, no-nonsense, and he doesn't seem to mind what he's doing um, as this bounty hunter. So he really takes in that mark and freezes him in carbonate, and then delivers him to Carl Weathers, who plays Geef Kurga. Uh, I probably pronounced that wrong, but that's okay. And Carl Weathers gives out bounties to guild members, so members of this kind of bounty guild. Um, he tries to pay the Mandalorian in Imperial credits, which is when we're reminded again that the show takes place five years since the dissolution of the Empire. And they really do a good job of reinforcing that everything in this universe is half broken, it's dingy, and it's otherwise in disrepair. So we also see that right in the beginning, where... Uh, Pascal doesn't want the unit with the droid, which we'll talk about in a minute, and so they bring him a different speeder that is on fire, it sounds bad, it looks awful, so that's kind of indicative of how everything is in this universe since the Empire fell. So the, the show does a really good job of world building. Um, it's phenomenal. They tell us so much without ever actually saying a word. They put details in the background, and uh, they also communicate the world through the Mandalorian's interactions with other people and how he just kind of walks around and doesn't really look at anybody or anything. Uh, it's really interesting, actually. But Pascal's Mandalorian isn't satisfied with his regular small paint bounty, so he takes a much bigger one, which moves us right along to Warner Herzog's client. That's his name. Uh, don't yell at me. And he's guarded by about five stormtroopers. And it's awesome to see these stormtroopers in this dirty, broken armor compared to this, like, normally lily white armor of the stormtroopers that we normally see them in. So Pascal still projects his quiet confidence, but we see him visibly moved when the client offers him a piece of Beskar steel, saying there's more after he completes this bounty, but he warns that it's going to be complicated. So the Beskar steel starts to get important right after we tour through this planet, and we get to see the city that uh, Pascal is walking through, and there's so much information given to us just from him walking through. There's so many details in the background that show you just how gritty and complicated this world is, and how difficult it is just to survive the means these people have to go through just to keep on living in this broken world. And that's going to be a huge part of this show moving forward and what I'm really excited about. So the Mandalorian visits another Mandalorian. This time it's a woman who's a blacksmith. And she thanks Pascal for bringing her the Beskar Steel, the little small square of Beskar Steel, which we learn is really valuable not only to the world at large, but it seems to have a symbolic place in the Mandalorian's uh, culture. So Pascal, Pascal has been offered an entire container of Beskar Steel if he completes this bounty. And with the show showing us how much the Beskar Steel means to him and his people, um, it's definitely going to complicate matters once we get to that cliffhanger ending because it's how far does he go to protect this bounty that he's going to protect while also trying to keep living for his people and help his people live. And I think that that's going to be a really complicated theme moving forward, and I'm really excited about that one. 
So we also see another side of Pascal's Mandalorian here. He's really multi-layered. Um, Pascal is differential to this woman. He's not scary. He's not confident. He kind of treats her as an elder, as a leader, and he kind of follows along with her. And as she melts down this piece of Beskar steel, every time she hits a hammer, Pascal gets thrown back into a flashback of him as a child. And we see that there's a giant battle going on, and his parents are away. They lock him in a bunker. Um, and now we're going to get to one of my theories, which is the, with the amount of times that Pascal references that he hates droids and with us seeing the battle, I'd be willing to bet that droids invaded his hometown and killed everybody, possibly except for him. Uh, and I think that'll pay off later. So Pascal then goes to this other world to capture his bounty. And here we see another side of him where he's kind and jovial to this alien man who kind of pushes him in a way we haven't seen before. He's not afraid of Pascal at all. He's not afraid of this Mandalorian. And he leads uh, Pascal to his bounty, which is being heavily guarded. So I got really excited because I was pumped to see the Mandalorian stealth plan to break into this bunker. But then Taika Waititi's IG-11 bounty droid comes in and starts guns blazing. And again, Pascal references the fact that he hates droids, but this time it seems very warranted. So then we get an absolutely incredible action sequence that shows how cunning the Mandalorian is. And he and the droid work together to get inside the facility where the bounty is being held. Watiti's droid is very restrained here. Um, they don't go with the slapstick kind of humor that they did in the beginning with the first alien bounty. Um, but the, the uh, bit between him and Pascal of him trying to self-destruct and Pascal telling him no is actually very funny. But there's no over jokes. He doesn't make a joke the whole time, which I think is really interesting. The show's really going for a certain tone. Um, and I think they do a much better job in the second half than they do in the first of hitting it, especially when it comes to Waititi, who you could just let go and let run all over your show if you wanted him to. So now we get to the absolutely huge reveal because we were told earlier that the bounty is 50 years old. But when Pascal and IG, IG-11 walk in, we just see a baby. It's in a small little pod. And then they open it. And it turns out, spoilers, that it's a baby Yoda, which is absolutely insane. Now, IG-11 wants to kill the baby, but Pascal shoots him first, um, which again kind of shows this complicated morality he has because he's not willing to kill this baby, but he is willing to kill this droid and this other bounty hunter and kind of blow up his own life uh, specifically to save this baby, this baby, this 50-year-old baby Yoda. I guess they grow incredibly slow. So now on to that huge reveal. I think the show did a fantastic job of showing us that Pascal really adapts his personality and what he shows um, to his circumstances, and he does what he has to do to survive. So he's this icy badass on the first frozen planet, but a lot warmer when interacting with the alien man on the desert planet. So the show also does a really good job of using the setting to reinforce what Pascal's thinking and how he's going to act. With that frozen, the mask, his uh, the T visor, which looks amazing. His personality, you can project anything you want on him, and he does a really good job of letting people do that. He very rarely speaks first. He lets others speak, and then he kind of adapts and moves on based on what they're giving him. And I think that's a really fun thing that they do. Um, but he doesn't kill the baby immediately because he's not the singular money-driven bounty hunter. He's a lot more than that, and we're going to get more information on him soon, and I'm really excited about that. So on to the actual story. I think Herzog's client wants to bring about an empire resurgence as he's still very much working with these stormtroopers. And we've only ever seen two Yoda aliens. They don't actually have a name for their species, I believe. And they're both very Force-sensitive and powerful. They were both on the Jedi Council. So I think he wants to raise this baby Yoda to become a Sith and then kind of lead this empire resurgence. Um, we know that doesn't happen, and that's one of the only downsides to the show taking place so far in the past from the uh, new sequel trilogy is that we can't impact the world too, too much. You can't rock the boat too hard to where the First Order never rises or to where the Empire rises again immediately after. And there's this whole second, separate story that we've never seen before because we're much further past that now. So that's, that's a limitation that we have. So we know that this baby Yoda won't lead to an Empire resurgence and it also won't lead to a destruction of the First Order. But we're still, we still have an interesting story grounded in Pascal's Mandalorian that I'm really interested to see. It's going to be about him, and it's going to be about his morality and how he justifies himself living in this world and what he has to do to survive. Um, so overall, I absolutely love this episode, and I love that we even have a live-action Star Wars show to watch, period. And I think it's fantastic. It's beautifully shot, beautifully scored, very confident, deliberately paced. Not a lot of words, but a lot of world building, a lot of show don't tell. So it's really, really good, really great, awesome episode with an absolutely bonkers cliffhanger, and I'm so pumped to see where it goes from here. But what did you guys think? Did you guys love the show? Feel free to let me know.